Hello and welcome to MZ Webinars. Thanks for joining us today. Really happy you could uh, join us. Uh, we're really excited to have um, MZ's MD Andy Derman with us today and Duncan Brown who is MZ's Senior Economist. They're going to be presenting on this really interesting and critical um, topic obviously. We want to know what's going on in the labour market and what's happening or what's going to happen in 2021. Um, before we start, um, if you want to put any questions in the questions box, please feel free to do so and we will try and get to those at the end of the presentation. If not, we'll follow up afterwards. Um, we will also be sending you the slides and the recording, so don't panic about that. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Andy. Hi, Andy. Hi, Debbie. Thank you very much and, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, for um, what I'm sure you will find is a very fascinating and interesting webinar um, today as we look back on uh, the year that was 2020 and the labour market. So um, I'm delighted to have Duncan join me to, to um, run through some of the stats. But before we get going, just uh, a quick welcome to uh, regular um, uh, attendees of MZ webinars. Thank you so much for for joining us this year. It's been fantastic to see the the volumes um, of, of of people who have engaged with the content as we've shared it through this year. And I hope you found it really, really fascinating, useful, insightful, and thought pr provoking because that's uh, what we're aiming to do with these. So um, for new uh, or first time uh, attendees, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully you, you will find this um, interesting and will want to join us for um, other future um, webinars as well. And just, just for those that are, are new or welcome a reminder, just wanted to, to sort of say um, a little bit about MZ and the work that we do. And ultimately, our mission is to help organizations like, like you and your organizations make better, more informed decisions about the labor market. Um, and uh, our view is that um, you need good data and good insight upon which to base those decisions. And so we spend our, our waking hours um, working hard to bring the best, most robust, most granular, um, joined up and holistic labor market insights to, to you so you can feed that into your own thinking, planning, um, and engagement activities. And we're typically working across the worlds of education and skills, economic development, and, and, and the world of employment um, as, as key drivers and actors in, in regional economies. So um, uh, that's, that's who we are and what we're doing. And so obviously a big part of, um, uh, of the work we do is not just about uh, collating the data itself, but hopefully making it useful. And, and we're on very much a mission to bring our expertise to bear and, and help you um, continue to better understand how you might think about the labor market, how you might leverage data about the labor market to feed into your own areas of focus and interest, um, opportunity and challenge. So today's webinar really is about picking out some of those uh, key headlines of what we've learned through the year, sharing our views on that. And I'm very grateful for Duncan who has collated some fascinating insight, um, content here and insight, and he'll he'll talk us through those in a moment. So uh, thank you, thank you, Duncan. Um, oh. So over to you, Duncan. And um, wow, what a year, um, 2020 yeah. in labour market terms. Yeah, it, it's funny to think that um, a year ago um, the main consideration was whether well I, I can't remember where. Well, had we had the election by now or not? And so there was the main concern as to whether we were going to have Brexit or not um, uh, um, and things like that. Um, and otherwise the labor market was really tight. Um, and um, the um, the government has, um, uh, uh, they either were before the election or, or, or stayed afterwards had got a deal and so there was no kind of feeling that the sort of the, the sky was going to fall in uh, when uh, the sorts of the UK formally left the European Union but of course that kicked us forward to another process which we're now coming to the end of and I'm sure we'll talk about by the end of uh, uh, this uh, webinar because uh, that that's coming to a head again now but in the meantime something rather large happened and uh, 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 sometime around March those kind of news stories that we'd all been dimly aware of about things going on in the rest of the world suddenly came home 
um, uh, apparently via people uh, going on skiing holidays in northern Italy uh, it was the main kind of uh, way that came home uh, so uh, 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 yeah and all of a sudden we did things that had never been done before in this country like closing down large parts of the economy intentionally to try and avoid um, uh, deaths running out of control and you know all, all for very good reason that we did those things but we've been on a bit of a great experiment in terms of the economy that we'd never intentionally sort of uh, uh, put it into recession uh, before so um, yeah so he, here's the first chart which uh, our job posting data has been really useful in keeping track of this because the advantage with job posting data is that it's near life and so it, it, yeah, uh, we're, we're collecting this every day. And so I've got a weekly total here of newly arrived job postings. Uh, the gray line is what the pattern was last year. Um, and you can see that it was actually fairly sort of consistent across the year. It was not kind of uh, uh, going up and down too much. And so the, the, there's a fairly sort of steady flow. Uh, this is from January to, I guess, um, either last week or the week before. And the green area is what happened this year. And you can see that um, uh, uh, in sort of January, February, March, it was actually a bit above the level that we'd seen in 2019. So the labor market was not only tight, but getting tighter, if anything. And then all of a sudden, um, within the space of a month, the, the, the flow of new job postings fell by half. Um, you know, so we had about 200,000 a week in January, February, March. And by the end of April, we were down around 100,000. And it stayed in those doldrums really for the next three months or so. Um, but the positive thing is that actually it started to pick up again uh, since. And so we come into the sort of the, the October, November period, uh, really around sort of 90 percent of the level that we saw last year. And so there, there are some positives in this if you take the, into account where we've been. Um, and the, the the really strong positive is that the lockdown that we've been in, in in November and the much tighter tier system doesn't seem to have taken the shine off that too much. It, yeah, it may have been without it that we'd have actually caught up with 2019. We'll never know. But at least it hasn't gone back into reverse. And so when we talk about lockdown in November, it was nothing like the experience in recruitment terms that the lockdown in April, May and June was. Uh, we're well above those levels. So, you know, it's been a, a very, very tough year, massive slowdown in recruitment. But as we come to the end of it, it uh, uh, the, the worst does seem to have passed. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, no, I think it's just important as well as a reminder around job postings as a, as a data set that um, what we're not saying is this is employment. Um, this is hiring intentions and volume of activity. And we often say, I think the great challenge is looking for the signals in the noise, isn't it, Duncan? And so whilst, whilst um, a lot of the official statistics will take a while to come through to give us the definitive view of volumes of employment, etc., we can use job postings as a bit of an early warning indicator. We did certainly back in, in March, for those of you that were following um, the analysis that we were putting out back then, it did give us an early warning as to um, a, a drop off of hiring activity. But it, as you say, really positive to see that's at least picking back up again. Um, so yeah. it right it's there. worth adding on that as well. I mean, you know, so the, the point about timeliness is really important that um, workforce jobs say is a regional indicator of jobs. But at the moment, you can only get data Q2, I think. I don't think Q3 is out yet. Um, and um, uh, and so that's quite a high level. But it's also because of, as we'll come on to furlough, actually employment hasn't moved as much as we thought it would, um, partly because furlough has been quite successful, as we'll talk about a bit in a, a moment. But um, and so that means that r recruitment, although it is very noisy, is actually the, the sort of the the, the most kind of informative indicator of what's gone on with employment demand and the, the, the sort of the valuable thing uh, in a moment like this is that you know when you see a fall of half as we mm. did March to April um, you know that a lot of that is signal and not noise um, you know that, that there's a natural variation that you get with job postings that we're used to and we can track over time and we've never seen a shift like that and so it's a, in situa situations like this that that uh, recruitment trend becomes quite a powerful indicator actually yeah absolutely so yeah and and here we've got some of this sort of the more traditional labor market data and 
um, I think some of these data go to October, some to September now. Um, so, uh, and these are the very highest level, you know, these are uh, unemployment redundancies and vacancies across the whole economy. And you can see um, the, the really interesting side and the positive side in many ways is that unemployment has sadly gone up, but not nearly as much as we might have feared when we were in that kind of second quarter period. It's only in the last few months, so at the end of summer, that unemployment has begun to st uh, start to spike. Um, and, you know, uh, if you compare our experience to, say, the US, I think their unemployment went up to something like 17 percent at one point, um, you know, because it just rocketed because they didn't have furlough in large part um, uh, or anything like as expansive a scheme as ours. Um, so, but you can see there as well, earlier than unemployment, vacancies fell. And this is a sort of the ONS measure, which is survey based, where they ask employers how many jobs they've got outstanding. Uh, that shows some recovery as our data does. As I say, this data I think goes to September. Um, so it's not quite as recovered as ours is. I would imagine there'll be some further recovery on that, but it's kind of, it'll be interesting to see. Um, the, the sad thing is redundancies have finally started to move up in the last few months of available data. But again, we're a long way from where we might have thought we'd be, given that we did effectively switch off a quarter of the economy in uh, the second quarter. And so, um, you know, this is all bad news. But, you know, I mean, we're talking about an unemployment level on this data in September, um, which was around the level it was in 2017. So it's you know bad that it's going up, but as of September, it still hadn't reached levels that we would normally consider to be a real problem. The question will be how how much further has it got to go before it will start to come back down again? And of course, while we are still in the tier system where you know the, the sort of the uh, hospitality sector in half the country is shut, then that remains a concern for the future. It is fascinating, isn't it, Duncan, when you when you live in the now and you hear the news stories and it does feel crazy doom and gloom economically, but you then look back at the previous recession and where we are relative to that, certainly on the unemployment figure, it's quite different. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's kind of, you know, the, 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 there's doom and gloom enough still and um, because we don't know how far it's going to go, as we'll see in a moment, actually, outside of the most affected industries a lot of the other industries do seem to be recovering fairly well and so uh, uh, I'm, a, a, I'm a lot more optimistic than I was a few months ago on this but you know th these are still human beings at the end of the day that are being affected and you know anyone being affected is a, 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 is bad news but you know so far you know, we're now in a world where people are being vaccinated or in a country that people are being vaccinated. We're, we're, we're ahead of the curve on that one, which is uh, 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 f finally a good news story on our handling of uh, uh, the coronavirus. Um, and so if um, by the spring, as anticipated, um, uh, um, we've got most of the most vulnerable uh, vaccinated and we can begin to reopen the economy more fully, um, it does give hope that the sort of the having delayed the spike in unemployment so well so far uh, we might be able to avoid the worst kind of outcome that we that back in april may june we were thinking it was going to be an extremely deep recession that we were going to go into and in many ways if you look at the gdp statistics it certainly was because people weren't earning money but because the government have been quite aggressive uh, um, you know, the, the government have done uh, 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 possibly two things well, we'll look at it in hindsight. One was uh, the furlough scheme and the other one was vaccination. Uh, lots of other aspects have gone really badly, but those two seem to have gone, uh, uh, well, uh, certainly in terms of uh, uh, the furlough scheme, it seems to have been uh, uh, quite effective. But if we go on to the next slide, we can uh, uh, get to that a bit sooner. So uh, this is a, a, a quite a complicated chart. The, the, uh, I am an economist, and so I do like to confuse people. Um, and so uh, this is a what's called a beverage curve. And on the x-axis, we've got the unemployment rate, which is a statistic we all know uh, well. Um, and then on the y-axis, we've got the vacancy rate, which is the number of vacancies as a share of the number of people who are either at work or looking for work. And I've plotted this back to 2006. And so the green line there it, um, with the big bunch at its top left is what life was like before the financial crisis. And then you'll see what happened in the financial crisis was, was that the vacancy rate uh, fell and dragged the unemployment rate up with it. 
because obviously fewer vacancies means it's more, more difficult for people to find jobs. Um, and then the dark blue, nearly black line that you see there is uh, the recovery from that. And you'll see that for a long time, we're talking 2010, 2011, 2012, the sort of the, 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 the depths of, of austerity and worries about a second dip and all of that, it sort of milled around at that sort of seven or eight percent level of unemployment and vacancies weren't picking up that greatly. And then around 2013, 2014, things started to pick up and vacancies started to come through and drag the unemployment rate back up with it. And then you go through this period 2016 to 2019 when we actually had um, a level of labour market tightness that we hadn't seen even before the previous recession. You know, unemployment fell below 4% um, and we had a really high level of vacancy. So we've had an exceptionally tight labour market. And then we get to March of this year and we get this light blue line where what we see is vacancies collapsing nearly, you know, going from a vacancy rate of 2% to below 1%. Um, and yet unemployment didn't rise. So that's really strange in itself. And that will be, as we discussed, because of furlough. And now it started to catch up with it. And so you can see unemployment starting to move quite aggressively from four to five percent uh, in the space of uh, three months. Um, and so our real question is, how long will that line keep going out toward the right hand side? Um, bearing in mind that the vacancies are starting to pick up, which should mitigate against that. And so that, that's the thing in the background that uh, uh, we have to worry about. How, how quickly can we start to pull the, uh, the sort of the line up to get more vacancies and how quickly does that have an effect in stopping unemployment going out to the right? Mm, interesting. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, 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 my, my second most confusing chart here, is um, so I've plotted every industry uh, in the same space for unemployment and vacancies because the ONS asks people where they used to work um, and ask employers about what sector they're in as well. And so on the left hand side, we've got what that uh, chart looks like in Q3 of 2019. Um, and you can see accommodation and food, um, which is the, the one to watch here. Um, it is actually all, normally a high unemployment but high vacancy sector. It's got quite a lot of uh, churn, as we call it. You know, people uh, lose jobs, but they gain new ones because there's so many vacancies out there. And then the other industries are kind of varying degrees of less churn than even that. And then on the right hand side, we've got the same quarter a year later. And you can see the sort of the, the huge effect that almost every industry, even health a little tiny bit, has seen a fall in this unemployment vacancy space. So a few fewer vacancies in health case or a lot fewer vacancies in accommodation and food and also uh, uh, an increase in unemployment. So, you know, that, that's a, a sort of a general effect. But you can also see how accommodation and food has been massively affected. So going from a vacancy rate of 5% to a vacancy rate of 2% uh, in the space of a year and actually in the space of about six months. Um, and, um, you know, this is quite a profound change. And when you think about that being uh, sort of one of our uh, most porous entry level labour markets that people can easily get jobs in, young people especially, um, uh, it's just been entirely suppressed and is now no more of a, 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 a vacancy rich labour market than the rest of the economy. Um, and so it's a really profound effect. You know, all the other industries have been affected to a greater or lesser, lesser extent. Um, I think um, public administration is maybe the only one that's kind of mildly better. Um, uh, but accommodation and food has been absolutely uh, uh, smashed in terms of unemployment and vacancies. And, you know, it's no surprise given our experience uh, of life and its coronavirus these past six months, really. Mm. So the reason why it's not worse, and it could have been a lot worse, is furlough. Um, so the government created a, a, a very aggressive um, furlough scheme, the coronavirus job retention scheme, um, that um, uh, for a while was um, putting people on 80% of their pay up to a relatively decent level of uh, maximum earnings. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we only have data here from uh, the start until September. Um, and you can see that its height in April, May and into June 
um, uh, one in four workers in the economy were on furlough, which is an incredible thing when you think about it, that we basically paid a quarter of the workforce to not go to work. Um, and, you know, uh, 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 on one level, that, that sounds a, an awful idea from uh, sort of a productivity point of view. You're paying a quarter of people not to do their jobs. But the alternative was those, pe th those businesses would have just let people go because they couldn't operate uh, given the lockdown restrictions at that time, which if you remember, most workplaces were told to close unless you were key workers, you were expected to close down. So building sites were to close down, factories were to close down unless they were doing something that was considered essential. And so those businesses would have had to have let those staff go. And we've seen this in countries that didn't do a scheme like this, that they did let people go in large numbers. And one of the things that we know about modern labour markets is that it's quite difficult to get people uh, into the right jobs. Um, uh, matching workers with job opportunity takes time. And so actually, when you see recessions, unemployment takes a while to come down, as it did after the last recession, because actually it's quite uh, difficult for people to find the right job for them. Modern labour markets are complex. People have different skills. There's no point, you know, it, it, uh, if you put me into a job as a car mechanic, well, uh, 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 don't come to that garage uh, as if, <laughs> if advice I, I'd have for you because I know nothing about cars. I know a lot about data. Um, and so uh, there's no point in me just going to any job that comes up because you know, in reality, we've got hundreds of labour market in the economy, you know, divided by place and job type. Um, and so uh, um, it takes a long while if unemployment is created for it to be uh, uh, wiped away again and because people have to find their way to the right jobs and that just does take time. Uh, and so the logic of furlough is to try and preserve matches between workers and jobs as long as possible in the hope that when the economy can come back to life, those jobs are still there. Um, and and so far, I mean, it's certainly been successful in avoiding the sudden surge of unemployment and so on, as we've seen that starting to come in now. There's only so long that businesses can just keep going because they have other costs besides staff. Um, but it has been successful in the short term. The, the big question is whether it will be successful in the long term, that when the economy comes back to life, um, uh, those jobs will stay there or will some employers just say actually we've kept you on furlough but we can't keep you any longer because we've not got a business left. Um, the positive sign as you can see here is that as lockdown was relieved in the summer and we went through uh, the sort of the easier period of July, August, September, uh, furlough use dropped a lot um, and th that was not necessary. It was originally due to uh, end in October but even by then, um, most employers had got their staff back to work. So it went from one in four uh, workers to one in 12 over a space for a few months. And so uh, now what we don't know is what happened in October and November, because all of a sudden uh, furlough was back um, and uh, um, uh, we had additional lockdown restrictions in place. So we do expect it probably went up a bit. and We'll have to see when the data comes through. Um, but as we'll see in a moment, the sort of the the, uh, the job posting data suggests that the lighter lockdown restrictions this uh, time have actually allowed a lot of a lot of industries to be working at a, a much higher level than they were before. So if you can go to the next slide, what we've got here is for each month um, um, uh, that we've got data for, we've got the number of um, uh, um, the, the share of employees that were furloughed, and that's the green line. Um, and then the level of job postings compared to the 2019 average, and that's the black lines here. So uh, and what I want you to do, first of all, is look at an industry like construction. So construction, like most of the economy, saw uh, uh, their job postings demand, so their recruitment demand, fall by half in a few months. Uh, so you can see the black line there. And about half of their workforce were also on furlough. So it's a really profound hit to that industry. But then you look what's happened since then, their furlough use by the end of September was really well down, down below the 10% level. And yet their job postings, even to now, to sort of October, November time, have actually recovered to the levels that were seen in 2019. And so actually their recruitment activity is up there. Um, as I understand it, um, uh, construction hasn't been badly affected by the most recent furlough because workplaces work have had social distancing in place. So there might be a blip up, 
but generally they've moved away from furlough and are back into recruiting now. And you can see a similar pattern with a few other industries. You look at real estate, you look at manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing is a bit below in recruitment terms, but not far off. Mining and quarrying there as well, uh, a bit come off since then. Um, and some of the service industries are a bit further behind, not using furlough so much because they can uh, work from home in terms of finance and insurance and information and communication there. But their recruitment demand is still a bit dented. Um, then the ones that are of interest because they affect a lot of jobs. Uh, wholesale and retail is not too bad a story. Wholesale and retail is an interesting one because you've got part of the industry that's had a great year. If you think about food retail and supermarkets. And the part of the industry which has had a really tough year, if you think about high street retail. Um, and so you see that their recruitment demand did fall off somewhat in November. So, you know, that's probably the high street retail and so on. Um, and it will be really interesting to see their furlough. But either way, it's still not as bad as it was back in the springtime when their recruitment demand was around a quarter of the level that it was back last year. But then the, 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 the troubling ones. Uh, our accommodation and food services and uh, to a slightly lesser extent arts entertainment and recreation their furlough use came off but we have to assume that that has come up quite a long way because of course actually they were entirely closed down in large part um, and their recruitment demand especially accommodation and food services remains a long way from home it's below you know it's down around a third of its level of last year and so what we're seeing is that while the initial shock hit everybody you know with the exception of say health and social work and public admin and so on um, a lot of the non-consumer service economy has actually come back to life to a great extent you know you look at construction you look at manufacturing people have gone back to work your business services is a, a bit behind um we're using furlough less but on recruitment there's still some way to go um but not too bad overall. You characterize them as being a bit more cautious than construction and manufacturing, say. So, but the production industry is really strong. It's these consumer service sectors, accommodation and food being the obvious one, then arts and entertainment and recreation, and then some of wholesale and retail where you've got real remaining worries. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so you can see how I've, I've tried to summarize that change by creating a pain index, which is kind of the deviation from um, uh, job postings trend and then the level of furlough. And the green bars are what it was like in September, which is the latest we've got the full data for. And the red dots, are what it was in June, which was kind of a high point. And so you see accommodation and food, not entertainment and recreation are way up there and we're always way up there. But you can see sort of construction, which is about six from the bottom. Um, uh, was quite high uh, back in June with the red dot, but is now quite low. And so you can see that a lot of industries have really come back a long way. Every industry has you know, made some progress by September. As I say, you know, with some of them, they're going to have uh, been hit again in October, November, and we'll see as that data comes through. But you can see that in a lot of industries, there was a real inroad made and you know, zero is back to normal. And so you can see health and social work and transportation and storage were you know, better than normal, actually. So it gives you a sense of the change over time. So if we go on to the next one, I've done the same index. Right. Done that one, Duncan. Yeah, I mean, the, the transportation and storage one is a really interesting one, isn't it? That, um, um, yeah, I think we've all, all, all seen in our daily lives. And I wonder if the, the, the time of year and heading towards, I know you mentioned this is September, so it might be a little early in that, but heading towards the, the, the Christmas season as well, um, might, might have uh, profoundly impacted that in a way that it's profoundly impacting other parts of the economy very differently. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. I mean, transportation and storage um, uh, um, has had a good coronavirus in many ways. It was hit quite badly in some areas at first. I mean, if you know any lorry drivers, um, it wasn't easy for them in the first few months because actually it was the big players that tended to do uh, uh, to sort of pick up the work and a lot of the, the sort of the more independent stuff because a lot of the industries were just closing down and supplies were difficult to get and so on um, but since then as industries have come back to life and the supply chain started moving that's restored their normal plus we're all doing a lot more online shopping uh, as we'll see uh, uh, later 
And so uh, that's really powered the transportation storage, which has been a, a bit of a growth industry over the past decade anyway, really. As we know, it, it, as you drive along the motorway, you see all the warehouses. But yeah, if we go on to the next one, I've run the same index for areas. And, and the main thing you say is that actually, um, areas are much less different than industries because every area has got some of each industry in it. You know, when you talk about the consumer services industries, which are the most affected, every part of the country's got restaurants and every part's got supermarkets. The interesting thing is that in a London West and in a London East, the two areas at the top there have probably got more restaurants and more hotels and more arts venues than average. So they are a bit more affected and that, that's uh, there. Some of the other areas are a bit more touristy and so obviously they've been affected a bit more as well. Um, but beyond that, the rest of the country is probably yeah, relatively similar in terms of its impact at this stage, because those industries outside of uh, very tourist location places and London tend to be quite well spread out. So if you go on to the next one, um, so we have done some work to say, well, at the detailed level, um, what industries are most exposed to um, the disruption that we've seen from coronavirus. And we've used furlough data for this alongside some other data um, uh, um, around the share of key workers and the level of physical proximity that people have in their jobs. And um, uh, um, um, because we have a staffing pattern in our data, we've been able to project that onto occupations to say, well, given the mix of industries those occupations work in, which ones are more exposed than others. And I've plotted them here, comparing the sort of the level of postings in different months, uh, so June and November, compared to what the level was like in February before coronavirus hit. And the sort of the dots are where we were in November and the beginning of the line is where it was in June. So you get a sense of not only where they are now, but where they've been as well. And you, the, the positive side of this is that most of them have actually seen um, a, an increase. And so you can see the dots at the top end of the line. There's the odd exception. Um, uh, but what you can also see is that those occupations that are heavily uh, um, in industries that are COVID affected, are much more likely to have not recovered. So if you look at the bottom right here, you can see uh, food preparation and hospitality, so restaurant jobs, uh, other elementary service occupations, leisure and travel services, hairdressers and related services, you know, where those labour markets are still in the doldrums to a great extent. I mean, if you look at hairdressers and related services, it's actually worse now than it was in the summer, whereas most of the economy is kind of moving back towards where it was and so there are opportunities in most jobs and the interesting thing here is if you look at the high skilled jobs is that they're much less affected by covid because many of them can work from home um, and they uh, uh, and, and their sort of job demands tend to reflect that a lot of them are still not quite at the level that we saw in february but they're sort of not as far away as some of these kind of consumer service jobs are so um, it's interesting um Duncan just pausing here just to think about some of the the, the earlier slides um, and your point about the purpose of furlough particularly as a short-term intervention to just keep people where they are best right now um, yeah. versus what the long term might mean so um, yeah I think the big the big challenge as you say is the the least exposure is definitely at the high skilled end we're seeing a, a divergence a little bit in the labor market that those areas that are being affected are those high volume relatively low low mid skilled labor intensive type roles um although good you know as you say good to see most of them recovering to some extent or another um yeah. So I think that's where furlough will really come into its own, won't it? Is is holding those labour markets in the right place? So I suppose the, the big question is how much of that is short term disruption versus what of that is more of a structural change that does mean intrinsically mean the unemployed, maybe not the furloughed, but the unemployed labour might be very much at odds with where the demand is emerging. And there's that kind of reskilling, upskilling dimension that's um, going to be a critical part of the longer term recovery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about a lot of those service jobs that are in the doldrums, they're the ones that are uh, you know, normally much more abundant and relatively uh, um, simpler for people with a wide range of backgrounds to get into. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, an interesting story here, by the way, is labour intensive roles. So these are the yellow lines that you can see have absolutely kind of rocketed up, actually, and some of them are now well above where they were in February. And this is where you think about um, 
uh, things like sort of warehouse roles, um, uh, sort of builders, labourers roles and so on, where um, a, a lot of them were affected at first, but have now actually come back to life uh, uh, in, in strong fashion, really. And so, yeah, whereas the service economy is the one that is still really struggling in lots of ways. And we often think of that, those those yellow bars, the labour intensive, as the the kind of the, the space where automation could have the biggest impact yeah. um, um and so it was quite interesting it, kind of one of these that um, maybe a, a relatively in in uh in in recession terms a relatively quick bounce back might have protected the short term on that one whereas if things had stuck around a lot longer yeah. you wonder whether and maybe that is still going to be the legacy that that automation agenda is is picked up and so whilst there's a renaissance right now it'd be interesting yeah. to keep over those roles in uh, through next year and into the following year to see whether well, whether uh, investments have been made in in automation that might start to impact again. I mean, there is another side of it that because you've had increasing demand for warehousing services and so on, that creates the financial environment that makes that creates good returns if you can find ways of automating. Um, a similar story, by the way, is that. In the high skilled labor markets, uh, because a lot of jobs are being done uh, by working from home without offices, uh, it will start to push the envelope on what can be done at distance. Mm. And, and that includes not within the UK. Um, uh, um, and so more transactional task based high skilled work. Um, you might have uh, been locked into a traditional employment model of hiring somebody to come to your office to do the job now you're yeah, you've got a more task based relationship with somebody who you don't actually uh, you're not in the same space with on a regular basis well that might open questions about well can that be done at a longer distance as well so yeah um that th there will be as we'll come on to a bit later a lasting imprint uh, mm. uh, of this and, and uh, those are additional questions for that so if you go on to the next slide um so we know that employment has been hit as we say it's not as much as we might have feared and that's great but what we did want to explore was who was taking that hit and so what i've done here is break down the change in employment for men and women by different age groups from september of last year to september of this year so the latest variable data and it's really quite interesting i mean that not greatly surprisingly although depressing given what we know about the of scarring on people who uh, try to get jobs in recessions especially when they've not got much of work history is that it's young people who are by far the most affected um, and uh, you look at 16 17 year old employment and it's down by 25 um, percent 18 to 24s is down by four percent now the thing i would say is that these are quite small demographic groups you know it, it, 16 17 year olds is two years so if um uh, so every year one year gets replaced um, and so if new arrivals didn't get to take any jobs, then that would wipe out 50% of employment, probably a bit more actually, just straight away. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite easy to get big numbers in those groups, but they are still big numbers. And one of the most interesting aspects of this is the gender dimension where um, among 16, 17 year olds, it's mainly female 16, 17 year olds who've been affected. But then in the rest of the picture, uh, uh, female employees have been much less affected. And in fact, uh, from 25 and up, there are more women in employment in September of this year than there were in September of last year. Um, and that's quite a striking pattern. And mm -hmm. uh, in the last recession, the people who were hit first tended to be slightly more likely to be men because it tends to be people in uh, uh, sort of uh, production roles and things like that in a recession that can often get hit whereas women tended to be affected later because they were in sort of public sector roles more, for example, which were you know, uh, public service roles like health and education, which were hit by austerity in the sort of the 2010. So there, there's some of that there, but it is still quite an interesting pattern. Um, the 16 to 24 year olds, of course, are the most exposed to the loss of jobs in hospitality. Lots of students have uh, jobs in hospitality. Um, uh, and lots of young people aren't students do as well. And so they are the most exposed. But yeah, so it's still, yeah, it's an interesting pattern all the way along. This sort of the gender split's interesting as well as the age split there. 
Yeah, and just to, to help explain the graph, so if we take the 25 to 34 year old age group, whilst there's been a slight rise overall in the employment volumes yeah. year on year, basically um, a, a, any growth on the, the women's side has been somewhat wiped out by the loss on the men's side. Um, yeah. And so yeah, 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 that's that right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like a, a sort of a, a two thirds of percent growth uh, in women's uh, uh, employment balanced out by sort of a quarter percent uh, decline in men's employment. Here's another dimension of uh, uh, different workers, which is really fascinating. So um, um, what, one of the, the the first most interesting headline on this is that um, workers with British nationality, more of them had jobs in September than uh, this year than they did in September of the year before. 0.5% uh, increase, in fact. Uh, so that that's quite remarkable because you know we uh, we all just assume that uh, uh, um, uh, most people, because you know British national workers are unsurprisingly the m uh, most numerous group in the British labour market, uh, um, uh, will have suffered a loss in employment. But actually, that largest group hasn't, um, and the reason is because um, um, most migrant nationalities working within the labour market have seen a reduction and in some cases quite substantial reductions and the most obvious one here is the line that says EU A8 and A2 which is the uh, um, accession 8 and the accession 2 countries so here we're talking about central and eastern European workers so A8 is Poland, Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia uh, and so on and then A2 is uh, Romania and Bulgaria and there's 300,000 of uh, them have disappeared from employment in the space of a year that's um, nearly a quarter, um, and uh, and that's remarkable. Um, uh, and that's September to September as well. Um, so it's not simply a seasonal effect. There may be an additional effect because seasonal workers who may have still been there in September uh, um, uh, never came. Um, but the, the numbers involved are so large that it's not just that. And so it, it seems, because uh, the unemployment figures for these nationalities haven't gone up uh, correspondingly, so it seems as if a large number of them have decided that uh, um, uh, it was better to sit out the coronavirus uh, probably in their home country, I would imagine. I, I doubt that they went to another country because everywhere has been affected. Um, and so that that raises a really interesting question as to you know sort of whether that's a persistent change or not, uh, and we don't know. The rest of the EU has also been quite significantly affected in terms of migration. So here we're talking French, German, Spanish, and so on. Um, uh, uh, it's quite a large number, so it's seven percent drop. Um, on the whole, um, workers from uh, uh, um, 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 uh, you know, those Western European countries tend to be more likely to be in uh, professional roles and so more likely to be able to work from home. So that's probably why there's such a big difference there. Um, uh, uh, and then you look at the other nationalities and so um, uh, Asia's seen quite a, a, a significant fall. Uh, and remember, this is nationality, not country of birth as well. So uh, um, there are a lot of people who were born in uh, uh, various countries who uh, uh, are not in these figures because they've got British nationality by now. Um, and then interestingly, uh, migrants from Africa, there are more of them in work by a significant number, 12% in September this year than there was in September the year before. So really quite a big churn going on there. And it's really quite interesting to think of sort of the dynamics behind it. Mm, fascinating. Um, and so, uh, as we mentioned a few times, one of the big changes this year has been working from home. And so uh, uh, um, this chart shows the sort of the uh, share of workers in each of these occupational groups who were working from home in the previous week last year uh, on the green dots and you'll see that sort of managers, directors and senior officials were the highest at uh, around a quarter um, and then the purple dots are when the ONS took the same data in April of this year and you'll see a remarkable uh, increase especially amongst the highest skilled categories there managers, professionals and so on where all of a sudden the, most of them, most of us, were uh, were working from home um, and that's a profound change. Uh, uh, you know, lots of people who used to go into an office every day suddenly never went. Um, and one of the interesting questions is, uh, um, you know, this has probably been growing a bit over time and all of a sudden we've leapt forward. Now, probably it will revert. 
once uh, you know uh, the economy has opened up after vaccinations have got far enough. But how much of it will revert? How much of this is going to uh, uh, change permanently? And you know, I hear stories in my networks about uh, uh, companies really considering their location strategy, um, considering that maybe they still want offices, certainly, but do they want as many offices? Do they anticipate people being in quite as much as they used to be? Because they found out that although it's really good to have people together, they don't always need to be together. And of course, actually, if you can spare people the commute, there's kind of significant convenience as well as environmental benefits from that. And so, yeah, it, it's kind of it has been a great learning experience for everybody. And some of that seems likely to stick. So the next slide, please. So and then this is another dimension on the same point. And so the, the purple one here is non-store retailing, which is online retail. Uh, the others are different categories of retail. And you'll see that most of them took a dive in the spring, um, the exception being food stores, which bumped up a bit because uh, we all went out to buy toilet roll, apparently. Um, and uh, 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 most of the retail has actually come back to a great extent, which is another good sign uh, as retail has been one of the, the worst affected. But the one that's really interesting is online retail, which went up to around 40 odd percent higher by May than it had been in February and has mostly retained that high level. Um, and so again, a, a lot of people who'd never got online shopping deliveries for their groceries, say, um, started to do that. And again, how much of that's gonna stick into the future? Because that was very much a growing business, especially in this country where uh, we've got some of the uh, sort of technology leaders. Um, um, and But all of a sudden it's like, we've probably done about five years of growth in one year. And you know, some of that again will revert, some people like going to the supermarket uh, um, uh, if they don't have to wear a mask, but some of it might stick because people, some people will have found that it's quite convenient to get somebody to bring you shopping to you instead, uh, especially when it's cold um, so uh, uh, and dark. Uh, so yeah, and then one last uh, chart slide, because uh, I've talked for far longer than I should have done, um, is uh, the change in skills. So I've picked the sort of the most significant skills in each of these four occupational categories and then sort of captured this change in the share of job postings that were asking for these skills in the last three months of this year compared to the same three months the year, a year ago. And most of the patterns fit exactly with where we'd expect them to be. So if you look at uh, um, uh, high skilled jobs, nursing is booming because nursing jobs are holding up really well while others have fallen back a bit. But some of the technology skills have also stayed hung on and you know, uh, all, all of this online working, working from home uses online stuff, all of the online shopping is is holding up demand pretty well for certain parts of uh, digital. So that's quite interesting there as well. Whereas business development has fallen because obviously uh, um, uh, if you don't have people on the road so much, you probably don't need to hire as many new uh, business development facing roles because actually the efficiency has probably gone up quite significantly. Um, on the middle skill side, you sort of your skilled trades are holding up well, whereas your clerical financial uh, skills uh, fallen back a bit. So that would be quite interesting to monitor going into the future. Labour intensive, we were talking about this before. You can see warehousing and PPE and palletizing and forklift operation all going up really well. Warehousing is booming, uh, where food preparation and restaurant operation have really been hit hard. And then on the service oriented, it's all of the education and care skills that are really uh, uh, coming up well, whereas telemarketing, and we can all be thankful for this, uh, uh, is uh, fallen back a bit. Um, to, to one of the, I've been monitoring the, the questions um, uh, as we've been going through, I don't know if you have one question posed around maybe the shift of roles within industry. So whilst industries like health have, have, have held up to some extent, maybe they have benefited from the fact that other sectors like food and accommodation have declined because actually some of those roles are important as uh, some of those sort of food preparation type roles are important in in the uh, in the care setting as much as they are in the um at restaurant setting it's interesting to see food preparation down in in the cluster of roles around labor intensive but up um, meal planning and preparation on the service oriented. So that might hint towards some of those those yeah, shifts. Absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, there, there's still a lot of uh, food preparation going on. 
it's just in a very different setting, you know, uh, uh, because actually people who are vulnerable and sort of meals on wheel services uh, provide them, it becomes even more important that that's done for them because relying on other people to provide for them can be dangerous uh, in the current environment. Mm. Well, thanks, D Duncan. Thanks so much. A really comprehensive view, and I hope um, I hope has been insightful for everyone. As we say, the slides will be heading round, so feel free to pour over them. Um, now, here's a quick summary on the slide um, of, of, of certainly some of the key things that you've picked out through through this analysis. And we won't, you know, with time, etc., we won't necessarily read read through through them all. But I mean, what do you think is the most profound? Um, thing that you've spotted in the data that is the most sort of foundational piece? Yeah, I, I think for me it's that there's part of the economy which we know is being really hit hard. Yeah, the sort of the consumer services thing, the sort of the you know your high street, your restaurants and your hotels. But the rest of the economy is nowhere near as bad as it was um, a few months back. Um, you know, if you go back to May, June, things were really bleak. But actually, a lot of us have found, as we have in our personal lives, found ways around it. And, you know, uh, 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 businesses have sought to get back to operation where they can. And that, that for me, augurs pretty well uh, for recovery. And especially now we have vaccination going on. There is sort of, a, you know, a, an end in sight. Well, maybe not an end, but a sort of a, 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 a significant, uh, uh, you know, a, a reduction in risk happening. And therefore, we can look at into Q2 of this uh, of 2021, uh, those restrictions being removed. And it seems to me that the uh, the sectors that are most affected, to some extent, can more easily uh, recover because the rest of the economy is looking in better shape than we thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. And then, and furthermore, you know, you had helpfully kind of put together some thoughts that I know you're chewing over, but thought would be helpful to share um, in terms of, well, where, where, what might this mean for, for, for next year? And it's interesting, again, looking across the questions um, and just trying to triangulate some of the questions and forgive me, folks, great questions there and lots of them. So thank you very much. We will come back to you. Um, but um yeah, just trying to triangulate some of the questions that are posed on um, by, by by folks here um, with, um, with with some of the questions you're posing of yourself. I suppose big big question for, is Brexit. Um, that's cropping up regularly in the questions being asked. Um, what's uh, yeah, what's your thoughts? Um, yeah, big question. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, but, yeah, so uh, it would be interesting to see some of the labour, the, the migrant labour data that you picked out there. That that hints towards something for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the thing is, is the question there says is that um, regardless of, in a way, what happens with a deal in the next week doesn't really change that much from a migration perspective because um, th there doesn't seem to be any discussion about that aspect as being a point of issue. The UK has decided that it wants to um, uh, run migration policy in its own way. It was never really a subject of discussion. Um, it's uh, already legislated for the new regime. That is going to be a very different regime from what has gone before because it's going to be uh, um, geared, although it has alleviated somewhat, uh, geared towards uh, skill selectivity, so not allowing as many migrants to come in to do sort of uh, 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 um, uh, labouring roles, you know, think about sort of uh, uh, fruit pickers on farms and things like that, um, uh, packing roles, things like that. Um, so on the migration side, in that sense, I don't think Brexit will change much from where we've already been going to. Most existing EU workers, including those that have uh, gone home now, will have the right to stay if they have got their um, uh, necessary paperwork sorted. Um, um, so th there is an interesting question as to whether people come back, um, uh, um, uh, given that you know some of them have gone home, um, um, and also whether um, that accelerates a shift in migration patterns. You know, we have seen a big inflow from Central and Eastern Europe over the past 15 years um, between the sort of the Brexit change and then coronavirus all at once. Will that lead to a more sudden stop in that? the labour flow than elsewhere. 
Yeah, interesting. Um, again, just looking through some of the questions, uh, questions just come in around creative industries. Um, where do they fit? So when we've looked at the industry groupings, etc., where, where have they fitted in in the analysis? Um, it, it it varies. I mean, some of them will be in arts, entertainment, and recreation. So if you think about theatres, and obviously they've been hit extremely hard yeah. um, because they like hotels and restaurants are almost by definition primarily about people going to places. You know and uh, Theatres, of course, are um, uh, 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 very bad from a transmission point of view because you're sitting in confined spaces. Um, and so uh, um, uh, um, they will have been hit hard, as we saw earlier, arts, entertainment and recreation is up there on the pain index um, alongside uh, accommodation and food. So we know that it's been hit hard. Um, there are other aspects of creative industry that fit within digital, with broadcasting and so on. Um, I'm no expert. My understanding is that they have sort of struggled a bit with TV production, although I think that they've probably found ways around it. Um, there still seems to be TV programmes coming out, so I'm guessing so. Um, uh, um, although it's uh, adding to their costs, it's not not uh, so much. But yeah, the, the sort of the the the, uh, the creative industries as we know them across the country have been hit hard because, of course, your local theatre, your local uh, museums and you know all, all of those kind of sectors um, uh, uh, will have been uh, you know really affected by um, lockdown and if you're in a tier three area it remains pretty much the same for example and I'm sure at tier two it probably does as well. Yeah thank you I, um, forgive me for not getting through all the questions there's a good good volume there but hopefully we've covered most of the themes there discussed so thank you very much Duncan really really interesting and and just on the, this point um, just wanted to flag up to you that certainly coming in early in the new year we'll continue the, the the discussion so the goal of today was to kind of have a quick look back but in in the new year um, we are currently putting the finishing touches to this we'll be launching a more detailed analysis of um, of 2020 and, and continuing to pose the questions about 2021 um, and we'll be excited to be launching that report um, on a webinar on the 14th of January you can see the details on the screen feel free to go and sign up to that now there'll be a report and we will also be um, putting together some local snapshots that you can request for your local area if you want to look at some of the headlines for your local area so details will be coming out um, early in the new year but just wanted to mark your card on that one this is definitely not a, a topic that has gone away it's something that we'll continue to look hard at um, throughout next year and of course as as things like Brexit etc raise up the agenda I'm sure we'll be spending plenty of time looking into the more specific uh, components as you've as you've hinted at uh, Duncan there so um, be sure to uh, sign up to that webinar and join us for that and get access to that report um, I just wanted to, uh, as we, we draw our hour to a close, just to say a massive thank you to you for joining us today and for joining us throughout the year. We've, we've wanted to bring as much of the insight we can, and I hope, I hope it's been valuable and helpful to you. Uh, and I just wanted to just close by saying a big thank you to, to you for the work that you do. Um, you know, it's one thing understanding these challenges, but as, as, men as mentioned uh, earlier by Duncan, you know, we're talking about real human beings livelihoods families here and a lot of the people that we work with and we're very proud to work with um, and a lot of people that are joining us today are very much um, working towards supporting their communities through these challenges and others and so i just want to say a big thank you for the work that you've been doing in these um, trying and testing times there's a lot of challenge but plenty of opportunity out there and our, our mission really is to illuminate that for the communities that you serve so that you can serve them even more effectively than you are so i just want to to end by saying a, a big thank you for, for for the work that you're doing there and and encourage you uh, uh, to take a good break if you can over christmas refresh because there's lots of work to be done in january for sure and of course a lot of the projects and programs that have been announced in supporting um the recovery actually start to kick in properly next year so um, I just wanted to end by saying a big thank you. It's been a, a real pleasure and honour um, supporting you. And please do keep challenging us. Keep posing the questions as you as you work through your challenges. We want to bring our data to to have as big an impact as possible in the work that you do. And of course, uh, want to wish uh, you a fantastic uh, festive period. Merry Christmas to to, to everyone. 
hope you get chance to in, in, enjoy it hopefully get chance to enjoy it with friends and family where we're available um and here's to a, a slightly brighter 2021 ahead so thank you very much and um and uh, have a have a have a great uh, rest of your day and a fantastic weekend and uh, see you in the new year